get off to another good start. Well, in other baseball news, former New York Mets outfielder George Foster today claimed that he warned the Mets about a drug problem last season, but he refused to identify the players he says were involved. Still the biggest story in Major League Baseball this week broke in St. Petersburg, Florida, when it was revealed that the Mets ace White Gooden, the 1985 Cy Young Award winner, tested positive for cocaine use and would be admitted to a New York clinic for drug rehabilitation. Gooden is expected to miss at least two weeks, uh, two months, pardon me, with his rehabilitation program, and without him in their starting rotation, the Mets are not as strong a favorite to repeat, especially since every team in the National League is looking to gun down the cocky defending champions. But as Dick Stockton reports, this team by nature will not go down without a fight. It was only a few months ago that the New York Mets won the seventh game of the World Series, beating the Boston Red Sox right here in Shea Stadium. The Mets won 116 games and no doubt were the best team in baseball. Theirs was a style of flair and showmanship that New Yorkers loved, but other fans and players hated. I can't stand the Mets. And the reason why is because they're an arrogant bunch of slobs. They were very arrogant and, uh, at times and almost wanted to rub it in your face. I hate the Mets because they're obnoxious. Gary Carr is one of my closest friends. But I don't appreciate when he stands out there in front of the crowd and incites the crowd. If they were to play in an IR, they may have had some sore ribs bubble with uh, some of the pitchers in the National League when I played there. <laughs> all they do all year is brag about how good they are, uh, and yet uh, the, uh, the reality of the situation is, is that they're just bums. It seems baseball fans had no trouble making up their minds about the Mets last season. They were just one of those teams. You either loved them or you hated them. Whether it was their on-the-field aggressiveness or their off-the-field mischief, the Mets were... ...curtain calls, hugs, and high fives. But for their fans who couldn't get enough, the Mets even obliged with a music video. game of the World Series, beating the Boston Red Sox right here in Shea Stadium. The Mets won 116 games and no doubt were the best team in baseball. Theirs was a style of flair and showmanship that New Yorkers loved, but other fans and players hated. I can't stand the Mets. And the reason why is because they're an arrogant bunch of slobs. They were very arrogant and, uh, at times and uh, almost wanted to rub it in your face. I hate the Mets because they're obnoxious. Gary Carr is one of my closest friends, but I don't appreciate when he stands out there in front of the crowd and incites the crowd. If they were to play it in an IR, they may have had some sore ribs bubble with uh, some of the pitchers in the National League when I played there. <laughs> all they do all year is brag about how good they are, uh, and yet uh, the, uh, the reality of the situation is, is that they're just bums. It seems baseball fans had no trouble making up their minds about the Mets last season. They were just one of those teams. You either loved them or you hated them. Whether it was their on-the-field aggressiveness or their off-the-field mischief, the Mets were anything but dull. To New Yorkers, they were colorful. But to many outside the Big Apple, they were hot dogs. Rivals wondered that they have to be so arrogant. All they saw was a seemingly endless series of curtain calls, hugs, and high fives. But for their fans who couldn't get enough, the Mets even obliged with a music video. to the rest of the league trying to knock the Mets off their pedestal. And when push came to shove, the Mets simply wouldn't back down.
And there goes Davis. This pitch is swung on and missed the throw down. Not in time. And Davis with the stolen base. And now look out. And now a little scramble as Ray Knight takes a swing at Eric Davis. And boy, all oh, heck is broken loose down at third base. And Ray Knight certainly started that one. As their reputation as the fighting Mets grew, so did the number of confrontations on the field and off. Four Mets found trouble with local police in a Houston bar, and it seems that you can't pick up a newspaper without reading about one Met or another involved in controversy. None of this phased the Mets' feisty manager, Davey Johnson, whose team scrapped its way through the postseason. You know, a lot of people don't like the Mets because of what they perceive to be an arrogant attitude, but brother, they can play some baseball. Here in the seventh game, 8-5 Mets, ninth inning, two out, nobody on the pitch, swing and a miss, and the Mets have won it. The Mets are the champions of baseball. Met players say they wouldn't be labeled as arrogant if they hadn't been so successful. People were singling us out uh, as a team because we were winning and blowing the league away. But, you know, if you look at it, uh, there's other players in the league that, that high-five and get in their Cadillac when they hit a home run and hot-dog it and take curtain calls. I mean, it's, it's all around the league now. The game has changed in that respect. As far as the arrogance and cockiness, I don't think it's there. It's just that we've got a great ball club and we just go out there and display a great deal of confidence. As some opponents see it, the Mets have earned their right to act as they please. I'm sure that there are a lot of people around the league that don't really care about the way that they do it, but the bottom line is that they won, and uh, that's what you have to look at. You can't get that way. You can't be that way without winning, though. Uh, being a successful organization, uh, winning uh, over the last three years like they did, uh, they worked hard for it. They deserve it. Uh, act the way they want to until somebody can prove them different. Uh, they are the champ, and uh, somebody can take it away. They'll be the same way, I guarantee you. Maybe the Mets are misunderstood, but champions often come across as being arrogant. Namath was pretty good at that sort of thing. They're... You know, you talk to Michael Jordan today, and there are those who may not know him. Uh, they might feel he's somewhat arrogant. Uh, there are some really special people out there with some special talents, and it's very difficult for them not to be. When you get 25 guys feeling that way in, in the same place at the same time, you've got something real special. Arrogance, it's often referred to, but I don't think that's necessarily bad. Now, in addition to the Gooden incident, the Mets have also lost star reliever Roger McDowell for at least two months while he recovers from a hernia operation. It's enough to make the Mets wish they hadn't let go of a promising but erratic young right-hander they had a few seasons ago. His name, Mike Scott. Since leaving the Mets, Scott learned a new pitch, went on to win last year's Cy Young Award. When we come back, Dick Stockton will take a look at that new pitch, the split-finger fastball, and how it's changing the game. Gimmick pitches are nothing new to baseball. Carl Hubble won more than 250 games with his screwball. There have also been variations of the old spitball. Some have mastered the knuckleball. Almost everything has been tried. Steve Hamilton pitching it. Oh, there's the uh, volley floater, and it's ball back. And Munster makes the catch. Holy cow, what a play by Thurman Munster. But it's a pitch perfected by reliever Bruce Souter that's frustrated batters for nearly a decade. And Souter doesn't mind sharing the secret of his split-fingered success. Well, I don't spread my fingers as far as I think most people think. That's, uh, I throw my fastball like that, and I only spread them that far and keep my thumb on the back seam. And really, I just try to throw the ball as hard as I can. And the ball slips out, and it gets that downward rotation. It's, uh, I can't, it's hard to explain how it all happened, but uh, it came pretty easy for me. Although arm troubles have sidelined the right-hander, Suter recognizes what the pitch has done for his career. <laughs> it made my whole career. Without the split finger, I would have never made it to the big leagues. I mean, it was just, I was just a mediocre pitcher. And uh, with the split finger, it changed my whole career around. Giants manager Roger Craig is the man most associated with the pitch. In 1984, he taught it to Jack Morris, who led the Tigers to a world title. Craig says it's a pitch anyone can learn. It's been an effective pitch, and I've always been a pitching coach where I can teach you a slider, or you a curveball, or you a screwball, or whatever. But I think this pitch, I can teach it to almost anybody. Craig 
turned Mike Kruko of the Giants into a 20-game winner last year. And the Astros' Mike Scott won a Cy Young, relying heavily on that pitch. Now Craig's former pupil is an opponent. I guess if he could look back, he probably wouldn't do it again if he knew that he'd have the Giant job the next year and we'd be playing against him. But uh, I was just fortunate that he wasn't uh, working for anybody at the time, and he took the time to teach me the pitch. Scott's not concerned about the split finger causing the kind of arm trouble that has plagued Suter recently. It's a lot easier on my arm throwing that pitch than throwing sliders and curveballs, which I don't throw anymore. That's the same motion as my fastball, and that has the least stress on my arm when I throw a fastball. So last year I threw a lot more innings than I ever had in the past, and my arm felt better at the end of the year than it ever has. The only people who don't feel good about the split finger are the men who have to make a living trying to solve the mystery with their back. As soon as somebody figures it out, uh, I'll let you know. It's an optical illusion. Let's, Let's outlaw it. Let's outlaw it. Well, here in Caesars Palace, these are the odds on different teams winning the World Series. The Mets and the Yankees are the odds makers' favorites. They think a Subway Series is a real possibility. That may not include this week's news, of course. There's also plenty of action for betters concerning Monday Night Superfight, where marvelous Marvin Hagler remains a solid 3-1 to one favorite. But when we come back, I'm going to be joined by Gil Clancy, John Madden, and some special guests as we look ahead to that Hagler Leonard showdown. Right now, though, we're just about a half hour away from our live championship bout between Carlos Santos and Donald Curry. And you see warming up here in his dressing room. We'll continue live from Las Vegas after this message and a word from your local station. Rounds of action in the USBA junior middleweight category. The champion Donald Curry defending against Carlos Santos, a former world champion. That fight upcoming here live on CBS Sports Saturday. Well, I've been joined by our colleague who will be uh, involved in the commentary this afternoon.